I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Alexander Belser, PhD candidate. He's a fellow and adjunct instructor in the Department of Applied Psychology at New York University. He co-founded the psychedelic research team at NYU in 2006. Alex is the lead investigator of a qualitative study at NYU, exploring how patients with cancer experience psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. Please welcome him. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How are we doing? We're on mile 23 and a half of the 26 mile psychedelic science marathon of 2017. I know you're flagging a little bit, so I'll try to keep it lively. My name's Alex Belser. I'm from NYU. Um, a couple disclosures. I've received funding. I received funding for Hefter. Um, I'm training to be a MAPS MDMA psychotherapist. Uh, I also get funding from Compass Pathways, which is working on European studies. And um, I'm really excited to be here today to share with you uh, a little survey study that we did about mystical experience that I think will raise some interesting questions. Um, and so just to signpost what we're doing, I'm going to talk for a little bit. Uh, and then, with no slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, alleged mystical experience or mystical experience. And then we're going to talk about... Um, a study that we did at the University of Pennsylvania. I'll be presenting empirical slides, but there won't be death by PowerPoint, and then we'll just go back to talking, okay? So uh, I'm not gonna try to kill you with visuals today. Uh, what I'd like to do is thank my colleagues and co-authors, uh, our first author, David Yadin at UPenn, uh, but also this st the study that I'm gonna present to you, our co-authors are Andy Newberg, the sort of famous neurotheologist, as well as Ralph Hood, who is the author of the Hood Mysticism Scale and sort of a grandfather in the study of mystical experiences. So let's start with a very brief question for everybody here. Is this entirely voluntary? You can abstain, of course. Uh, I ask you to just take a moment and take a breath. And I ask you to reflect on the most significant spiritual, religious, or mystical experience that you may have had in your life, in this body, in this time. Now, only if you feel comfortable doing so, uh, if, you've ha if you feel as though you've had a mystical or mystical type experience, I'm not going to ask you to share it, but if you'd like to sh sh just let us know, you can raise your hand. Okay, now look around the room, look back. Okay. Now, as you look around these people, if you look to the left and you look to the right, do you find yourself saying, whoa, what, what kind of experience did that person have, right? Or have you ever had the experience of trying to explain to somebody that you care about your experience and that maybe found that a little dissatisfying when you tried to explain? I want to tell you what happened, and it was amazing, and I met God, and it was in, and God appeared to me in bunny form. You know, these, these are, and, and people think that you're a little bit nuts, right? Um, so, so today we're going to talk about alleged mystical experience and how we can think about discerning and distinguishing between various forms of exalted spiritual experience in the human inner subjective life. Um, and so here's a little thought experiment. Um, would you guys like to do a little thought experiment as a group together before we get into the theory? Okay, so, so I, need, I need five volunteers just to play actors with me for a second. Can you raise your hand? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, so uh, can my volunteers stand up for just a second? Okay, now everyone else who's sitting down in the room, you are, uh, I am consecrating this space as the Hall of Mystical Evaluation. <laughs> You are all council members, and we're going to uh, ask our actors here, just for a moment, to present their mystical experience for our, our judging. So we know in, across the continents that there's all different types of mystical experiences, and so for the candidates, we're going to support our candidates. All of you have already, just for a moment, all of you have already had a mystical experience, and you've told us that you've had some sort of mystical experience. And now, just 
creatively, can you tell us how it was in just, in just one or two words, how it was that that mystical experience came about? Was it spontaneous or were you doing something? Were you taking medicine? Were you having a practice? Would you like to start, sir? Sure, sure. I'll repeat it. You go, just go and tell me. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, mystical candidate number one. No, no, hold on a second. <laughs> It's true, and, and, and I, I thought of thermodynamics, and I thought of relationship between economics and the world, world order, and, and, uh, and, and um, that, that you can do it. You can figure out how everybody can be happy in the world through thermodynamics and the water flowing in the backyard of my house when I was getting ready to come to the conference. <laughs> Let's hear it for a candidate. So I feel, I, there's no doubt in my mind this man has had a profound and authentic mystical experience. But I also have some difficulty understanding, right? There's like, there's like the, the poverty of language. Now for the interest of time, I'm going to ask our other mystical candidates to sit down for a second. We can imagine that they all presented their case to us. My question to you, I know, you did such a good job. You just covered, you covered the, whole, the whole world. No, it's perfect. So what I'd like to ask everyone in the hall, you know, so there's various options here. Um, you know, people have meditated for 20 years on Azafu. They've had a near-death experience. They've taken LSD at Burning Man and had a mystical experience or claimed to. People have had, it's like St. Paul, an epileptic seizure on the road and had his conversion experience. They've had years of Christian prayer practice like Meister Eckhart. Sadhu sitting on a bed of nails, mortifying their body maybe an ayahuasca journey in the jungle near Iquitos taking plant medicines, or maybe something just happened spontaneously. So council members, I ask you, what's the real deal? Who among them has had a truly genuine and authentic experience? So in other words, will the real mystic please stand up? This raises all sorts of thorny theoretical, ah, there we, there we found them. So are all mystical experiences created equal? Is it one mountaintop or is it a range of mountaintops? And how are we to be the judge, especially when we're coming from various religious and wisdom traditions? So in sum, how can we compare in meaningful ways the interiority of the deepest human experience and come to know it for what it truly is? And does it matter how it came about? Spontaneous or earned? Devout religious practitioners versus and contemplatives versus people who just had an experience and smoked something once upon a time and has no practice to support that, per se. So what would you say to the charged, uh, as has been often leveled against people, that these are merely drug-induced hallucinations and nothing more? That these are not, in fact, mystical experiences, but are uh, m m mystical mimetic experiences or mimetic mystical experiences, things that just mimic actual, authentic religious and spiritual experience. So in the 1960s at the University of Oxford, there was a fellow named uh, Zayner, Professor Zayner, and Zayner called mystical experiences triggered by psychedelic drugs psychedelic mysticism and argued that these experiences could not be equated with spontaneous or genuine authentic experience. Zayner claimed that although psychedelic experiences contain content related to nature and unity, they lack a sense of, sacred, of true sacredness. In this way, the grace of God, God can't be scheduled by your dose time, by the sunshine makers. And interestingly enough, today, in 2006, when Roland Griffiths and his team at Hopkins presented their findings of psilocybin with healthy normals, he did not use, they did not use the word mystical experience. They called it um, a mystical type experience, suggesting a secondary class of experience that was not quite mystical experience. They weren't willing to make that strong claim, but they had a type of experience that resembled mystical experience while taking mushrooms. So, 
how are we to distinguish between these two and what questions should we be asking? Now, if we try to prove equivalence using fMRI studies, that's problematic, right? We might be able to reliably occasion things that look like mystical experience in a machine, an fMRI machine with psilocybin or LSD, but we, don't, we can't just tell people to have spontaneous mystical experiences on command, right? We can't compare them in that way. And also, how do we know that a flickering of the temporal lobe in the fMRI machine actually is an experience of a mystical state of consciousness, or to use Christian terms, the grace of God? I'm gonna offer you two tests, theoretical tests, that I think will be helpful. So first, we turn back to W.T. Stace and before him, William James. Uh, and then once we will use these tests to evaluate uh, is the study that I'm about to present. So Stace is writing in uh, the 1960s, a contemporary of Zaner at Princeton, and he gives, uh, gives us something called the principle of causal indifference. So he states the following. It is sometimes asserted that mystical experience can be induced by drugs, such as mescaline, lysergic acid, etc. On the other hand, those who have achieved mystical states as a result of long and arduous spiritual exercises, fasting and prayer, or great moral efforts, possibly spread over many years, they are inclined to deny that a drug can induce a genuine mystical experience, or at least look askance at such practices and such a claim. Our principle says that if the phenomenological descriptions, and I'll just paraphrase, if person X1 says I have had an experience P1, and person X2 has an experience P2, and the phenomenological language these two people use to describe their experience is the same, then we can't say, that regardless if this was occasioned by LSD and this experience was occasioned by a spontaneous experience, we can't say that their mystical experiences were, were different. We have to be indifferent to the cause. And so Stace concludes, this will follow notwithstanding the lowly antecedents of one of them. And in spite of the understandable annoyance, the annoyance of an ascetic, a saint, a spiritual hero, who was told that his careless and worldly neighbor, who never did anything to deserve it, attained to mystical consciousness by swallowing a pill. The second test is provided by William James. So James apparently had his own religious and mystical experience in the Adirondack Mountains while hiking. And he says of it this, it seemed as if the gods of all the nature mythologies were holding an indescribable meeting in my breast with the moral gods of the inner life. But we also know that James was a frequent user of nitrous oxide, and he calls that the anesthetic revelation. So at the time, psychedelics were not a controversy. Instead, what was a controversy was asceticism. And he, James describes in his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, a saint who was with his followers, and the saint lived in sackcloth, and he would fast and not eat, and he would, had biting insects and lice in his sackcloth. And his followers said, please, please, give us your clothing. We will hold it next to the hot fire, and the flames will drive the biting insects out. And the saint said, no, no, this is, this is my practice. This is how the saint achieved his mystical experience, through the, the pain of this experience. James's contemporaries thought this is madness. This is diabolical mysticism. This can't possibly be coming from a just and good God. And James admonishes his buttoned up contemporaries when he was delivering his Gifford lecture saying, you must be ready now to judge the religious lives, the religious life by its results exclusively. And I shall assume that the bugaboo of morbid origin will scandalize your piety no more. So James quotes the Bible, and he proposes what he causes, calls his empiricist criterion in the American pragmatist tradition. He says, by their fruits ye shall know them, not by their roots. He holds that common sense must judge. And he advocated for judging the religious life and experience and mystical experience by the fruits that it bears, not by its roots or origins. So let's get to it. This debate has been almost entirely theoretical in nature until now. This is an early attempt at testing this hypothesis. And so I'll start with the study here. Uh, it, we compared psychedelic versus non-psychedelic mystical experiences. These are my co-authors. Uh, I'd like to really honor them even though they're not able to be here with us tonight. 
We, uh, this is a University of Pennsylvania sponsored study of 739 participants. When they came to the survey, they were told it was about religious and spiritual experience. And they were asked later on in the study, was this experience related to taking a psychedelic drug? And, it, and then curiously enough, about half said yes and about half said no. So we had two groups to compare, right? Left side of the room, right side of the room. And then we compared means on those measures. And so these are the primary tests. The first test that we looked at uh, was the test of stasis principle of causal indifference. So we have the uh, psychedelic drug. If you took a psychedelic drug, does that predict a, a more authentic or a greater endorsement of items on a, mystic, on a scale that measures mystical experience? And then we also tried to test James's roots and fruits hypothesis, the empiricist criterion. So we looked at about for the people that had taken the psychedelic drug occasioned with their mystical experience, uh, did that produce a reduced fear of death, greater health, greater family connection, an increased sense of purpose, religiousness, and spirituality, and as well as a composite measure. So in our, you know, we, the survey here, we had primarily white Caucasian participants at 82%. They were mostly middle class. We had an unusually high number of atheists, about a quarter in the sample. And we had uh, to exclude from 839 down to 739 due to missing data, which is common in this sort of analysis on the measures of interest. Um, I'm going to skip over this, uh, but there were some differences between the excluded and the non-excluded sample. But we also took, uh, we also conducted an expanded model, which just means in the expanded model we control for demographics. We control for ethnicity, gender, socioeconomic status, educational attainment, uh, and hallucinogen use. So the measure of mystical experience we used comes from Hood. Uh, it was used a, a subscale of the death transcendence scale that's based on the mysticism scale. And the sample items were things like, I have had an experience in which I felt everything in the world to be part of the same whole. And I have had an experience in which I realized the oneness of myself with all things. And so this was on a scale from disagree to strongly agree. And we also asked about psychedelic experience and then we had all of our outcome measures regarding things like reduced fear of death and greater spirituality. So I'm gonna show you a few results slides. So initially, we just do a simple statistical analysis using Spearman correlations and independent sample chi-squares. But then we do an expanded model where we control for all of the demographics using a series of ANCOVAs. And so these are the hy hypotheses that we're looking at. And, you know, we use the null hypothesis. We thought that the people on this side of the room who had used the psychedelic drug and the people on this side of the room who had a spontaneous experience or an experience of mystical ex import uh, that came about by other means. We said, you know what, we're going to have equal measures on both of these. We, we don't think that any one group is going to have stronger uh, mystical scores or stronger scores on the fruits and the outcome measures. And when we ran the analyses, what we actually found, and I'll, this is our correlation table and this is our uh, expanded model table, but when we look at the analyses, what we actually find is that um, the group that had taken psychedelic drugs scored significantly higher on their scores of mystical experience, on their, on their hood mysticism scale experience scores. We also find that the people who had a mystical experience that was occasioned by a psychedelic drug had a reduced fear of death as compared to the other people who had mystical experiences. They had an increased sense of purpose and they had a deeper spiritual experience following that experience than, the, than their uh, compatriots in the other group. We did not find significant scores on health, family, or religiousness, at least in these particular measures. But I think there's some issues with these measures. They're not you know, as comprehensive as they might be. And so overall, on the composite score of the fruits, of all the different fruits that a mystical experience might bear that we measured, we found significant scores between people who had fr uh, an experience where their, the roots of their tree were in the psychedelic ground versus the roots of the tree being in some other soil. So in conclusion, when we compared experiences that were induced by psychedelic substances, those experiences were rated as more mystical, resulted in a reduced fear of death, an increased sense of purpose, and an increase in spirituality. And these remotes re did remain significant in an expanded model that controlled for gender, education, socioeconomic status, and religious affiliation. 
Okay, some limitations. This is not a representative sample. We had a lot of atheists. If it's an online survey, so you have some self-selection bias. It's also not a prospective longitudinal study, so there's no inference that can be drawn from this, right? This is all correlational data. And there are a number of potential confounds. So the psychedelic group did have lower levels of education, lower SES, and higher number of atheists and male respondents than a non-psychedelic group. We did the best we could to control for that, but these are not completely equivalent groups, right? We also found that psychedelic use was inversely related to education and socioeconomic status. And so I have some concerns about the constructions of measures too. So this was a check all that apply format. It said this mystical experience, what is, uh, basically the question is, was it also related to opiate use or party drug use? And we found a very s small but still significant correlation between opiate use and the, and the mystical experience scores of our participants. We also found a significant uh, score on the party drug use, which could refer to any number of hallucinogens, but it's hard to be clear what party drug means to a given person. So. That's interesting. We did not find significant scores for people who used antidepressants, for people who had psychiatric medications, sedatives, or anti-anxiety medications. None of those were linked significantly with mystical experience. So, I'd like to wrap up in the next five minutes or so uh, with some conclusions. So, this, as far as I can tell, was the first and simple test of these two theories, Stasis Principle of Causal Indifference, and James's empiricist criterion, by their fruits ye shall know them, not by their roots. Interestingly, uh, the Hopkins team a few years later began a study called uh, the Encounter with God survey, which has slightly different measures, but goes about trying to answer some of the same questions. Um, what we find with this study, this very early study, but it does make some suggestions, it, res it suggests, the results suggest that not all, mystical experience, uh, not all mystical experiences are created equal. Everyone who raised your hands in the room earlier, it's hard to imagine that your experience was a unitary experience with everybody else's necessarily, right? I'm not sure what that means. We'll get into that in a second. And so I, the, the findings also from the study cast doubt on the assumption that religious and spiritual mir uh, and mystical experiences that are induced through psychedelic drug use are any less genuine, any less positive, or less spiritually significant than spontaneous experiences or spontaneous experiences that have come about through other means. On the contrary, our participants rated psychedelic occasioned experiences as more genuine, more positive, and more spiritual. So a few broader thoughts in closing in the next few minutes. It may be, of course, that psychedelics are not the cause, but rather the occasion of the experience. It may be that psychedelic-induced experience is more reliably a powerful moderator of, con of consciousness than spontaneous experiences. So, you know, in the future, we might want to do a matched subject study, where literally we match a psychedelic user who'd had a mystical experience up with a person in a statistical format, uh, a controlled format, who had had a matched study, who had had a mystical experience by other means. And we match them on demographic data, intensity of mystical experience, and track their outcomes or their fruits. I think this study also raises some really complex questions about how to measure mystical experience. There's this idea in the psychedelic community from the perennial philosophy that it is a unitary concept, that there's only one mountaintop and there may be many paths, but all of the, you know, we all walk up the mountaintop and that's where the mystical experience is. Uh, and there's some good confirmatory factor analysis to justify the MEQ is a, is a real construct that holds together. But Zainer, to his credit, talks about in his study of Eastern philosophy and various forms of uh, samadhi and other things that he says there's actually five, at least five different types of mystical experience. It's not just one thing. It's maybe multiple classes of human experience and people are having different experiences. And to collapse them into one thing is, is really a simplistic thought. And the idea that it's all just one thing is maybe a holdover from a Judeo-Christian understanding of an encounter with one God. So um, in our qualitative research at NYU, we are looking at um, the question of 
what do people, how do people describe their experience? And what other things are we not taking into account? Are we not measuring? And people describe a variety of different things. And if you're interested in that, I can talk about that at some other time. So in the psychedelic community, I think that there's a sort of preciousness around the mystical experience. Um, we know from statistical analyses that if in these studies you have a mystical experience on this measure, that it does predict our clinical outcomes, reduced anxiety and depression in patient samples, for example. But when we run those mediation analyses, this black box of what happens and then we have decreased outcomes, those mediation analyses only show a 0.35 level. What that means is that it only explains 35% of the variability in anxiety and depression scores. So we know that having a full mystical experience predicts the fruits, the outcomes, the lessened anxiety, for example. But it doesn't necessarily predict the other two-thirds of the experience. Like, where is that coming from? We don't know. It is yet to be understood. It is yet to be studied. Um, we, it raises more questions than it answers, really. So it's not the only mediator, at least that particular form of mysticism. So in my final conclusion, I would just like to say that William and James addressed his audience in over 20 lectures over many weeks. I have only had 20 minutes. And although James didn't even get to mysticism until his 16th lecture, he tantalizes his audience far in advance, stating, when we reach the subject of mysticism, you will undergo so deep an immersion into these exalted states of consciousness as to be wet all over. I don't think I've gotten there quite yet today. Maybe later tonight. But in his audience, in his audience, there were many conservative, buttoned-up Christians who dismissed asceticism, which was the controversy of his day, not psychedelics. And he does say, you must be ready now to judge the religious life by its resu results exclusively. And I shall assume that the bugaboo of morbid origin will scandalize your piety no more. So today, religious, spiritual, mystical experience that's occasioned by psychedelic drug use, it's often dismissed as Ill illegitimate. And the bugaboo of morbid origin continues to scandalize. The current study and our results suggest that mystical experiences can equal or even surpass the intensity and spiritual aspects of those experiences that are derived from spontaneous or other means. So thank you for your time today. Oh, wow. Really well done. I wish we had time for questions. I bet there are 100 people who have questions in here. I'll be around. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah.